Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. This is episode 73, I believe. It's for the week of uh, September what 9th, uh, 13th to 19th, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be Oh, your ranter and raconteur talking about things important to me, I think, deserve your attention. Uh, as always, comments, questions, reactions, hints, news bits, whatever, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Um, and uh, if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here somewhere a couple times during the show and uh, you can go there and get the web address uh, get the email address rather from there I just ask if you do send me email to please include something like uh, your uh, left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the uh, subject line so I know it's not spam and to please be a little patient I do answer my mail but sometimes I'm a little slow about it all right with those ordinary introductions out of the way we'll get to it now first off I've got some good news. I, uh, I like to start with good news where I can, and I've actually got a couple of bits of good news. The first one relates to um, voting, voting rights. I've been telling you, in fact, I've been telling you for over a year now about these attempts to restrict the ability of supposedly more liberal voters to be able to vote. And last week I was talking about a variety of ways that that was done, including a registration law in Florida that uh, put so many restrictions on voter registration drives that even the League of Women Voters gave up on trying to do it. The thing is, these voter registration drives are the way most new Democrat voter, Democratic voters get registered. Uh, the result of this has been that while new Republican registrations were largely unaffected, new Democratic registrations crashed to a small fraction of what they had been before. Well, the good news is that in doing that, I missed something. I missed the fact that last week, Federal District Judge Robert Hinkle issued a permanent injunction against this law after Florida agreed to drop its appeal of the temporary injunction he had previously issued. That law is gone. Now, the downside of this is that this may have come a little too late to have any real impact on registration in this voting cycle, but the fact is anything that pushes back against these attempts to keep us from voting is good news. Uh, now, the other area where I've got some good news, and I've actually had a fair amount of good news on this over the past several months, the area of same-sex marriage, and I've got two bits of good news here. Uh, one is about DOMA. This is uh, the Defense of Marriage Act. This was passed back in 1996, I, I think it was, during the administration of and signed by every Democrat's golden idol, Bill Clinton. What this bill does is it defines marriage as one man and one woman for all purposes under federal law and for federal benefits. Well, there have been a number of cases recently where uh, federal courts have found that this law is unconstitutional on the grounds that it discriminates against and denies benefits to an identifiable group of people without there being any compelling state interest in doing so. And one of the good things that the, that the Obama administration has done, credit where it's due, is last year said that they were not going to defend the Defense of Marriage Act in court any longer. There is one suit, actually, that's under appeal right now. This is in New York, New York State, where same-sex marriage is legal. And there was a woman who had to pay $350,000 in federal estate taxes after her partner died because the federal government won't recognize their marriage. The good news about this, again, the case is ongoing, but the good news about this is that Vermont's attorney general, state attorney general, has just announced that Vermont is filing a friend of the court brief in favor of this woman, in favor of the plaintiff. Uh, his name is William Sorrell, and he said this past Friday that uh, the Defense of Marriage Act denies same-sex couples federal benefits and so unfairly discriminates against them. Two other states, New York and Connecticut, have also filed friend of the court briefs in this case on behalf of the plaintiff. The other bit of good news on this comes out of Washington State. Now, the state legislature there uh, passed a bill to allow for same-sex marriage, but this law is under challenge in a statewide referendum on the ballot this fall. Uh, 
Well, Survey USA, they are a polling outfit. Uh, they recently asked uh, likely voters in Wisconsin, uh, in Washington, rather, um, this question. I'm going to quote it just to get it exact. A new law passed by the legislature would allow same-sex couples to marry in Washington State. Should this law be approved or rejected? According to the poll, approved was at 56 percent, rejected just 38. Uh, and what's more important than just those raw numbers is the point spread. Back in July, the same outfit ask the same question. There the point spread between approve and disapprove was just seven points. Now it's 18. Uh, now the proponents of same-sex marriage, the proponents of justice, are not getting overconfident. They know they're likely to face a wave of last-minute scare ads, which is what usually happens from the troglodytes in these cases. But the fact that the support for same-sex marriage appears to be growing in Washington is very good news. All right, from there, we're going on to uh, the Clarabel Award. And we're doing that right now because the awards, there's actually two dishonorees this week because they are on a related issue, which is related to what I was just talking about. The Clarabel Award, as always, given for acts of meritorious stupidity. The first person, the first dishonoree, is the chief prelate of the Church of England, the Archbishop of Canterbury. His name is Rowan Williams, and he's stepping down after 10 years in that position, and so has been giving interviews looking back. One of the things that happened during his term, during his time, was that the Church of England experienced some severe divisions because an openly homosexual Anglican bishop was ordained. His name is Gene Robinson. He's an American. And Williams said he didn't do enough to prevent those divisions. He said he should have gone to the U.S. sooner, that he should have engaged more directly. But engaged to do what, he didn't say. Um, he did say that, I want to quote this again, he said the church had, had not exactly been in the forefront of pressing for civic equality for homosexual people and said, well, yeah, we're wrong about that but then immediately turned around and reiterated the church's opposition to same-sex marriage. Um, now, I assume the church is still opposed to sex outside of marriage. So what he's actually saying is that the church thinks there should be uh, civil rights for gay people so long as they don't act on their sexuality. In other words, as long as they don't do anything related to where the church is concerned. This is like some corporate CEO saying that gays should have equal rights except in areas related to employment. <sighs> Rowan Williams is a clown. All right. Uh, oh, by the way, somebody mentioned in a comment on this whole discussion, let's not forget, religion is a lifestyle choice. Uh, the other person involved here is Maryland State Representative Emmett C. Burns, Jr., Maryland has an initiative on the ballot this November for same-sex marriage. Brandon Ian Badejo, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, Brandon Ian Badejo, he's a linebacker for the Baltimore Ravens. He spoke out in favor of this. And Burns, who was a Democrat, responded by sending a letter on his official stationery to the owner of the Ravens saying, quote, I find it inconceivable that one of your players would publicly endorse same-sex marriage. And later in the same letter, quoting again, I am requesting that you take the necessary action as a franchise owner to inhibit such expressions from your employee and that he be ordered to cease and desist such injurious actions. In other words, a state representative is using his position as a legislator to urge an employer to do whatever it takes to get an employee to just shut up about an issue of public importance. Just stating that is proof of what a clown Emmett Burns is. But there has been pushback against this. Uh, Ian Badejo tweeted that, uh, he said, football is my job, it's not who I am. And the Ravens, to their credit, issued a statement supporting his right to free speech. But uh, even better, even better than this. Uh, Chris Cluey is the punter for the Minnesota Vikings. 
He has been active in a campaign against an anti-same-sex marriage amendment being proposed in Minnesota this year. He heard about this, and he wrote this hilarious, profanity-riddled letter to Burns. A lot of this letter I can't quote in the air, but I did want to include this part. Quoting the letter, I can assure you that gay people getting married will have zero effect on your life. They won't come into your house and steal your children. They won't even overthrow the government in an orgy of hedonistic debauchery because all of a sudden they have the same legal rights as the other 90% of our population. Rights like social security benefits, child care tax credits, family and medical leave to take care of loved ones, and COBRA health care for spouses and children. You know what having these rights will make gays? Full-fledged American citizens. Well, right on Chris Cluing. You should find the letter. You should look online. Uh, you can actually, I'll, I'm going to have a link to it on, uh, on my website. But uh, it really is hilarious, the letter. But the letter still has no effect on the fact that Maryland State Representative Emmett C. Burns Jr. is a clown. All right, from there, move on to our regular weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. Now, last week, I gave you 10 reasons why Barack Obama does not deserve your vote. One of those reasons was that he has failed to prosecute Wall Street crooks. In fact, he's refused to do so, not just failed, refused to do so even when presented with evidence of outright fraud. So I guess this should not have come as a surprise. Back in January, he formed the Residential Mortgage-Backed Securities Working Group, this group was to hold accountable those financial institutions that wrecked the economy uh, through their arrogance, their greed, their conceit, and their multiple crimes. Now, a source in the investigation says, barring a Hail Mary pass, there will be no criminal charges coming out of this group. Instead, the working group is going to focus on civil charges, which might, might, I emphasize, result in some financial penalties for the, for the corporations, but no jail time for anybody. Now, the thing is, one thing is that the settlements like this, they're, they're almost never as large as the gain the corporations got from their criminality. But even leaving that aside, the fact is the money to pay these fines will come out of corporate coffers, they'll come out of stockholders, they'll come out of fees to investors. They will not come out of the pockets of the executives who actually made the decisions that led to the fraud. It won't be coming out of the pockets of the people who actually ripped off the clients, who actually nearly brought down the entire economy, who actually committed fraud. They will pay absolutely no penalty at all, because if you think this will even impact their careers, you have not been paying attention. So now we not only have banks too big to fail, we have corporate executives too big to jail. Again, this probably shouldn't have come as a surprise, but it doesn't change the fact that it's an outrage. And we are going to take a break. And we are back. And uh, so now for the rest of our time, uh, I'm going to be talking about something which actually is a little bit prompted by, uh, by what I was just talking about in Outrage of the Week. Plus the fact that I finally managed to notice an anniversary before it happened rather than after. Uh, next week, September 17th, is the first anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, September, 11th, uh, September 17th, 2011... Uh, was the day that a group of people set out to symbolically occupy Wall Street by occupying Zuccotti Park uh, in Lower Manhattan. The initial group was composed mostly of, uh, of young, recent college graduates who, uh, in the words, uh, to give you an idea of the impact of, of Occupy uh, and how widely spread it, 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 its, its notoriety became, this was actually a description used by an organizer of migrant farm workers in Florida. He said these were, these were uh, young people who had, who had, what did he say, had studied their eyebrows off. Uh, they burned their eyebrows off studying. 
only to emerge from school with a degree that proved to be useless because there were no jobs, no prospects of jobs, and they had bone-crushing mountains of debt. They realized, as they looked around them, at their, at their, looked at their situation, at their darkening future, a realization sank in. Uh, the game was rigged from the beginning. It was rigged from the beginning by and for the benefit of those that they aptly came to label the one percent. The game was rigged, not just against them, but against everyone who was not part of that power elite, not part of that one percent. That the yawning gap, the chasm between them and us, between the ultra-rich and the rest, was not just something that happened. It was not just a characteristic. It was the defining, it was the central, it was the controlling fact of American economic life. Now, they may not have known the actual numbers. They may not have known the actual statistics, the actual data. They may not have known that the top 1% of the country owns 38% of all private wealth in the United States, double what it was a few decades ago. They may not have known that the top 1% get 20% of all of our national income, double what it was as recently as 1970. They may not have known that the claims about job growth are Potemkin villages, that they are myths, that they are false facades, they are dishonest because they, because they hide the reality of our shrinking futures. Three-fifths of all jobs lost during the recession were middle-aged middle jobs. Three-fifths of all the jobs that have come back are low-wage jobs. This has been the most anemic recovery since the Great Depression, and we are becoming a nation of low-wage workers. They may not have known that as a result, there are fewer good jobs in our economy today than there were 11 years ago. But the thing is, that's nothing new. That's nothing new. Because of something else they may not have known, the, the middle class has been shrinking for years. U.S., the, the average income of a U.S. worker peaked in 1970. 42 years later, after 42 years of economic growth, the average American worker is worse off than they were 42 years ago. They may not have known that nearly one out of every two Americans is poor or low income, the highest ratio ever recorded. They may not have known any of that. They may not have known any of the other statistics. They may not have known that, uh, that the reason unemployment has dropped is because more people just gave up looking. But they did know the feel of it. They knew the feel of all that. They knew that their own sense of frustration, their own sense of creeping despair, of creeping desperation, they knew that that sense was not theirs alone, but was suffused through our entire economy, through our entire society. They knew that even people with good jobs, with decent incomes and decent benefits, even those people had to fret that a single economic crisis, a single layoff, a single unexpected expense, a single medical issue, and suddenly they've lost everything they had. So they occupied, and they rallied, and they marched, and they stayed. And suddenly the proof of what they had seen, of what they had sensed, was suddenly seen in several places, then in dozens of places, then in hundreds of places around the country, then in dozens and hundreds around the world. Occupy was everywhere. In fact, the phrase became, Occupy Everywhere. Even the corporate media had to take notice. Now, in this, they were helped along, admittedly, by some typical but usually better hidden thuggishness on the part of the uh, New York Police Department. But even the corporate media had to take notice. Even the politicians and even some among the punditry had to take notice. This was no longer just a camp of young folks who could be dismissed with sneering references as, as Newt Grinch tried to do with get a bath and take a job, uh, 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 take a bath and get a job. No, this was something serious. It was a genuine movement. More than that, it was a revolt. 
It was a revolt, one that, like almost every revolt, came as a complete surprise even to those supposed experts who claimed they had their finger on the pulse of the nation. References to the 1% versus the 99% became commonplace. They even became uh, commonplace among the chattering classes. They were coming out of the mouths of politicians. The phrase income inequality started to appear often enough, again, even in the mouths of those, of those handful of politicians are actually reachable, that it was becoming serious enough that you might actually have to do something about it. Worst of all, the movement had some successes, including stopping several foreclosures. That gave people hope. Hope that they could not just object to the corporate overlords, to the bank overlords, but they could defy them and sometimes actually win. That was too far. That was too much. Occupy had to be stopped. More than that, it had to be crushed. First came the velvet glove, the sudden spate of concerned op-eds and concerned statements from politicians in November last year, after this been going on a couple of months, about how it was time for Occupy to, if you will, fold its tents and get into serious political action, real political action, in order to, and this must have been a group, uh, a group, a focus group tested phrase because it appeared so often, need to make the changes we need to make. Now, why if these people know about these changes and know they need to be made, why they don't just go ahead and make them? Well, they didn't explain that part. They were saying to Occupy, stop doing what you're doing. Stop using the methods you've been using. Uh, uh, stop using the methods you've been using. Start using the methods that have been used all along. Start using the familiar methods, the ones we're comfortable with, the ones that serious people have been using these past decades. Stick with the methods that serious people have been using, even as inequality has grown, even as the big, biggest banks have just gotten bigger. Stick with the methods used even as employee pay shrinks to its smallest portion of the economy in over 80 years. Stick to the methods that serious people have used, even as corporate profit grows to the biggest portion of the economy it's been in over 80 years. Use the familiar, the comfortable, the serious methods that have been used, even as the top 1% gets richer and richer and has the biggest share of the national income in over 80 years. Forget this encampment business, they were told. Stick to the methods that have been used as decades of economic progress have been stripped down, dismantled, and tossed aside. Stick to those methods. Well, I've said before that the strength of the Occupy movement was that it was something the empire, the power elite, could not ignore. It wasn't a one-day event. It was an ongoing, uh, in-your-face presence that the empire did not know how to ignore. So when the velvet glove failed, the iron fist came down. It came down in a coordinated, coordinated wave of assaults, assaults by both courts and cops, assaults on Occupy encampments. Almost all of these uh, assaults using the same tactics, including limiting press coverage, and almost all of them making the same, exactly the same claims. It was all about, uh, about unsanitary and unsafe conditions in the encampments. In fact, if you don't believe me about this, documents obtained from the Department for the Protection of the Fatherland under a Freedom of Information Act show that, yes, there was a federally coordinated effort against Occupy. And they largely succeeded. They largely succeeded, not in eliminating the movement, because these days you don't look to eliminate a movement. You don't even try. That's not needed to crush a movement. No, all you need to do uh, to crush a movement, because you know this stuff about jailing them all or killing the leaders, and eh, that's all passe. That's old-fashioned. Now, that has happened here. Ask any historian of the labor movement. But that's passe. That's old-fashioned. No, you don't need to crush. All you need to do is to make it invisible to make it a series of local bits and pieces so that anyone seeing it won't know your part of something bigger. And that's what's been done to Occupy. Um, and this has been done with the eager approval of all the punditry. Uh, just the other day, Occupy Hong Kong, which had been going on for 306 days, was shut down. And with obvious relief, the New York Times referred to Occupy Hong Kong as the last vestiges of what was once a global movement. But Occupy is not gone. It is still there. 
in this, uh, early this month, Occupy Chicago held four days of actions at Obama campaign headquarters. They've marched in solidarity with striking teachers. Occupy Atlanta turned out hundreds of people for a march to the headquarters of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, demanding uh, relief for struggling homeowners. Uh, on September 9th, Occupy Wall Street in New York had a burn your debt rally where people burnt their debt notification letters to protest the lack of assistance. Um, and of course, there are plans for a rally in New York to note the anniversary. But the point is here, these are being presented. These are being uh, uh, cre uh, they're seen as strictly local events. That's how, the, that's how the empire is keeping this, keeping a lid on this. Um, there's, they're, they're, they become strictly local stories. Now, the organizers, the participants, they're aware of the variety of other events, but most people in the community are not. To them, Occupy is something that no longer exists. And the, if I can use the cliche, empowering feeling of being something bigger is no longer there. That is how you crush a movement. You don't try to eliminate it. That might actually bring more attention. You just fragment it and so demoralize it. Now that victory is likely to be short-lived. The frustration is still there. The creeping desperation is still there. The sources of the frustration and the desperation uh, are still there. They continue to drip their poison into our national lives. The devastation wrought by the power elite has expanded beyond the traditional bounds of the forgotten, the destitute, the isolated. The communities that it has wrecked now include more than, than the Native American reservations and the trailer camps of migrant farm workers uh, that spread beyond the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, the back hills of Appalachia, the inner cities of the Northeast, and all the other places we have long allowed ourselves to forget. It's spread beyond this, and it will continue to spread because the greed of that power elite is insatiable, and it won't be satisfied until it has eaten all the meat, gnawed the bones, and sucked out the marrow, leaving us only with the scraps that fell from the table that they thought weren't worth the effort to pick up. Resistance will happen. Revolt will happen. The future will come. May this be... Please let this be a nonviolent revolution. Please let it be a nonviolent revolution. But the fact is, revolt will happen because the conditions that lead to revolt are still there. But I do guarantee you one thing. Whenever this revolt happens, however it breaks out, it will, as it almost always does, come as a surprise. All right, I think that's it. I think I'm done for now. Uh, I'm going to stop here. And uh, there's obviously a lot more to talk about on this and on other things. But uh, for now, I'm just going to leave you with that thought that it's not just it's resistance leads to revolt. And we need to revolt because what we're facing is revolting. You have the best week you possibly can. I will see you next week.